Hello and welcome to Future Procurement. My name is Robert Freeman and I'm uh, happy that our audio podcast is becoming more and more popular. It is already more than two and a half thousand people all over the world are listening to our episodes, which is just fantastic. Thank you for being with us, dear friends. And uh, all of you have, uh, can have another great news today. Today we are joined by Margaret Gilbert from uh, New Zealand. Today, Margaret is procurement consultant and trainer. She is the author of Contract Matters books covering procurement, and she is a super, super experienced procurement professional. Welcome to our podcast, Margaret. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you. First of all, Margaret, please share your background with me and our listeners. What is your procurement story? It's really interesting and uh, quite fascinating. So maybe you can share it to everybody. Sure. Um, I've been involved in procurement for about 26, 27 years. Um, it's been a mix of working um, in, in my home country, New Zealand, but equally further afield. Um, I work, have worked for government, local government and private industry as well as um, internationally, for, for example, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. in the United States. Um, when I returned from the United States, I, I guess I moved over to the dark side, so to speak, from being a buyer previously to now being a supplier, um, as I saw that there was a need to better educate um, um, both sides, um, both buyer and supplier. Um, I, as a buyer, I'd always heard buyers criticise um, how badly suppliers were doing, whereas I'm, I'm and I was had a belief that. There is fault on both sides. Um, It's not like it's all one side is doing it wrong and the other is doing it perfectly. Um, And so I also felt that there was a huge misunderstanding between the two sides. And so the business from day one has really been about trying to connect both sides and get a better understanding about procurement, you know, from the supplier side as well as the buyer side. So I guess that's so. It's 14 years now since I've been. I'm a supplier, I guess, but I still think as a buyer, as a buyer rather than a supplier. I have to say, Um, yeah. And the aim for Corporate Contracts uh, Management Limited, which is my business, is to educate the uh, the, you know educate the world, so to speak. And Mm. my unofficial vision has been to save the contractual world. And of course, I'm sitting in New Zealand, which is way down in the end of the earth. And of course, if you want to save the contractual world, you actually have to get out in the world to do that. So I travel quite extensively. Yeah. So you are still located in New Zealand, but you travel in in, in the region and also... uh... Quite yes. Far else I have seen. Yes. Uh, well, I land up working in places like um, uh, Africa, um, the Middle East, um, Europe, um, as well as Asia and the Pacific, which is a bit closer to New Zealand, of course, but still a fair distance. Fantastic. And Aust- and Australia, of course. So it's sort of w- it's, it, the business is worldwide, really. And current uh, currently, you are doing the consultancy as a main. Uh, Correct. And link with that is training and, and, exactly. um, and, yeah. and the books usually follow along in terms of either course material or whatever they, where, wherever I go, the books go. And so they sort of got around the world now, so which is good. Fantastic. And uh, so, so uh, it's interesting, two, two points in your uh, job biography, if I say. Uh, you said you were working in International Monitor, Monitor Fund. Yes, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Is, it, is it a secret of, of a government secret or can, can you say what kind of... No, but it's, not a, it's not a secret at all. Um, I was just working in, in for the IMF in, in, in relation to uh, contracts, um, okay. procurement contracts. So it's not a secret at all. How, how does it differ uh, from... Uh, what we are used to have in, in procurement. It doesn't I mean, differ. It doesn't, it doesn't differ doesn't. at all. It's only in terms of um, expenditure levels. Um, um, so, so rather than dealing in thousands or hundreds of thousands, it's more likely dealing in the well. It is dealing in the millions. Uh, it's very interesting. And not just a million on an occasional basis. It was like millions on a daily basis. 
So the but size the is the... are the same, of course. And uh-huh. where I where I learned procurement, which was in New Zealand, and it was just bigger expenditure levels. That's all. Mm. It was a useful experience. Okay, uh, that, that's interesting, and that's actually uh, what was my what, one of my questions in a little bit uh, further on. But maybe as I ask it already now. Um, I thought about uh, comparing different countries, comparing different uh, sizes of companies. I mean, uh, do you see the similarities? And uh, mainly my question was about the main uh, differences, actually. So uh, comparing different uh, countries and different uh, uh, sizes of business, do you still see the same, same patterns and uh, there are exactly. there are same patterns and it's interesting to see that the same issues seem to be sort of floating around and um, and and one of the issues and problems is is that as people want to take shortcuts and as soon as you take shortcuts okay. that you get into bothers and of course in some countries of course there is um, uh, infrastructure issues, which means the procurement has to be done differently than what you and I would be used to. Uh, I'm primarily talking about e-procurement, which is not possible in countries um, where there's no stable power supply okay. and the infrastructure is poor. So it's interesting how the procurement is, occurs there. Mm. But there mm. are similarities as well, and I think the intent is for, is for it to be done right. Mm. Is that it's just that there is sometimes lack of understanding, um, yeah, and the, and the means to achieve, I guess. Interesting. F- for me, just I will give a, a short uh, background why I ask this question. For me, I changed quite many countries, uh, not maybe as many as you did, uh, yes. and mainly in Europe when I was working for corporate yeah. uh, procurement organizations and. Uh, now consulting, I'm traveling to mainly North America and throughout Europe. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, I really see that the differences that I observe in different companies and different sizes are rather about the cultures or the soft factors, so to say. But yes. uh, applying the principles, applying the, uh, mm-hmm. d- uh, developing the procedures, uh, mm-hmm. still to my uh, observation is uh, quite the same wherever you go whatever yes. company I was working for more or less the, the routines the procedures were quite similar we have uh, different abbreviations we have different yes. uh, even names of departments somebody call it purchasing and uh, yes. not procurement somebody call it procurement not purchasing it doesn't matter uh, the, the routines were the same and uh, the, the way of working were quite the same uh, but this uh, kind of soft things and like you say maybe infrastructure is different in different countries uh, the level of development and maturity of economy is different but still uh, to my uh, observation it was quite similar do do you have the same um, uh, view or maybe you see some maybe particular difference in some regions or in some uh, industries I I agree with what you you have been saying, but I also think there are other reasonably significant issues okay. in terms of like Africa, for example, where there's a huge and it's not just the only place in the world, but um, where there is a corruption issue, for example, mm. and it's the perception of um, doing it the easy way rather than the right way. Okay. You know, um, and there's also, and just as just a general comment, is basically is that procurement practitioners often are very narrow in their thinking and really don't look at things from a strategic perspective and sort of, you know, don't have a little box and sort of say, this is the way we've always done it, so let's yeah. just continue doing that. So I think there's a need for procurement practitioners actually to need to grow and, and to have um, look at uh, um, issues in a bigger light, so to speak. Interesting. So this is the example that <laughs> this kind of cultural thing yeah. grows so deep with the roots into routines that it becomes yes. a routine in the end, right? Yes. But okay. there are some cultures like Asia, for example, where you're not supposed to question, you know, this is the way it's always been done. So, you know, don't don't question it, you know, um, because you don't, you don't ever question your management or anything like that. So... Mm. Um, yeah, so cultural stuff is interesting, but 
I think there is intent there to do it the right way in most instances, but, mm. you know, sometimes the ability to do is not great. Uh, very interesting comment. And uh, can, you, can you tell the, the second uh, part which I was uh, taking from your story, so to say, in, in procurement was that you were changing the sides. And uh, you, you yep. were both a, a procurement uh, specialist and supplier. Yes. So yeah. c- can you elaborate? And this is maybe uh, the, the main thread I want to have today uh, of you being... Uh, today you are also doing uh, trainings, for example, both for procurement departments yes. and for suppliers. Yes. So That's procurement right. for suppliers and procurement for procurement organization, right? Yes. So can, can can you elaborate on this one? And from one side, we say that it's conflicts uh, between procurement and supplier. But from the other side, it is very, very natural um, interlinked uh, connection. I mean, uh, that supplier wouldn't uh, exist without people who are buying from them, who are purchasing Correct. from them, right? And vice versa. It- so it's a natural uh, th- they should be naturally interested in one another and there should be so many more like connection points than conflict yes. points. So can yes. you elaborate on this? Uh, sure. On your observations um, here? Well, I come from a buyer background and, and, mm. and as I said, um, in the last 14 years, I'm now on the other side in terms of being a supplier. There is a, as I said before, there's a lack of understanding between the two sides, and I'm amazed that in 2017 that should still be the case. Um, and it's also sort of seen as confrontational type stuff, you know, and a, and, a, and a them and us rather than thinking about it from a, using the word we, you know, we mm-hmm. working, uh, both buyer supplier should be working together. And it sometimes is, doesn't work particularly well, and I'm not sure, sure why that is. Um, and from the supplier side is that they would be quite happy to work closely with buyers. It's just it's the buyer side that is not really um, who are just wanting to keep their distance, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I think if you if the buyers actually listen to the supplier expertise more often, mm. that they could they could probably help them better than what is occurring at the moment. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that mm. I don't think suppliers understand what buyers are looking for. I don't think they promote themselves particularly well, especially when it comes to a proposal response. Um, so there is misunderstanding on both sides. Hmm. But I think it's, I think it's you've got to recognise that both sides need each other, which is what you were mm-hmm. you were saying yeah, a moment ago. You know, but sometimes you wouldn't believe that if just by looking at and seeing there's some, I hate to use the word friction, but I think that's what it is, mm. some some friction between sort of what the roles are, I guess. Interesting. So it's like you said, buyer needs to buy in the end and seller needs to yeah. sell in the end. So it's, yeah. I mean, it should work according to just definition. <laughs> But yes, uh, these yes, restrictions and conflicts appear. And it's amazing just what does get done, especially considering there is this sort of uh, feeling of um, not sure whether we can trust the other party, so to uh, speak. So trust you is know? one more thing, because you said about listening and understanding to, to yes. core areas. And I think yep. trust is, is one more thing which we can add to this one. It, it is very important. Mm. Yep. And to build this trust... Uh, what what does it take to build this trust? I don't want to answer this question by myself, but from your right. uh, long experience and from your being on both sides, what does it right. take to build this trust? Well, I think it's sort of, I think there has to be trust to even enter into any kind of an agreement between the both sides. And I think that has to come earlier in the piece about having a conversation and having a discussion and coming to agreement and being having the aim of working together. And I think there's a need, and, and I think where we've gone a little wrong is keeping it at transactional procurement rather than looking at transformational procurement okay. and without looking at uh, ways to collaborate and you can only collaborate with suppliers that you um, have had dealings with for quite some time and then to move in terms of collaboration. You wouldn't want to do that just for a new supplier that you haven't had dealings with before. So the trust has to be present before you can move from a traditional type 
you mm. know, transactional type procurement to more transformational. But we've really got to move to transformational procurement, really, in my belief. Mm. Mm. We will touch upon uh, this uh, a little bit later, uh, but uh, about moving forward and w- what yeah. do you see the, as the future? But so far, maybe we, we can stop a bit uh, on, on uh, the moment today and maybe a little bit uh, with a the, with the background or with the history. Uh, so you said for trust, it, I mean, just following routines, as I hear you, is not yes. going to make this move into transformational procurement i mean no, there is still some soft uh, factors that matter or when you say soft factors do you mean what i would call soft skills as in communication skills as exactly. in sort of, but yeah. i mean this building trust uh, to me yes. is already like i mean how can you uh, yes. you, you cannot uh, monetize it you cannot uh, quantify it this is what That's i mean right. yes Well, the trust is going to come by talking with and understanding the other party mm. and um, and trust will go from there. And it's going to take communication, which is one of the obvious soft skills that's necessary and one of the skills that procurement re- people really need to get to grips with. Mm. Because I think procurement people, uh, procurement practitioners or buyers, um, they don't promote procurement particularly well. They hide their successes in terms of any wins that they will achieve. And so their own organization doesn't understand them particularly well either. And rather than going out to the organization, they wait for the organization to come to them. I mean, I think that's got to change too mm. as we move forward from transactional to transformational. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. And uh, yeah, so w- we had a short pre-talk before we started yeah. the, the recording and we were touching upon um, yeah, promoting procurement inside the company, yes. uh, how, how to make this uh, work more uh, visible, how to show the successes, yep. not only the problems with procurement. Do mm-hmm. you have any particular hints on this one? for very practical advice maybe for for, uh, people listening to to us now? Sure. I think practically is that we need to we need to communicate more internally. We need to um, get a procurement voice un- uh, that's been that's listened to. I think we need to be talking to management and getting seeing if it was possible to have um, some consistency of of procurement practitioner roles, and so there is somebody at the board table, so to speak, to get the message across. I mean, uh, we could use IT. IT is a perfect example how they have promoted themselves and how uh-huh. they are seen. And I think it's time for procurement to do the same. Well, it's past time for procurement to do the same thing. <laughs> and it's time for us to have a home rather than coming in under corporate services or finance or whatever. Um, you know, like IT has its own home on an org chart. It's time that procurement exactly. has the same thing. Why are we? Why are we always the poor cousin? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's time to be recognized and I don't think procurement is recognized and, and, and sufficiently enough. Can, can you give uh, some, as I say, particular example or some good way how oh. to do it for, for uh, as I say, for well, our listeners, just finish and listen in this podcast. What, yes. what can you really go, go to the office and what can you do? Well, I think that first of all, we need to get our key messages uh, clearly uh, clearly outlined. Okay. We've got to get our own house in order before we can start going to talk to management and saying, this is what we can do. Um, and we've got to be confident about saying what we can do and saying that we want to be, you know, we want a voice, we want to be heard and we want to be listened to and paid attention to. We have got to do it ourselves because if we, I mean, if we wait for management or whoever else, we'll wait forever. No, it's exactly. time that we became more proactive and as to what we need and want. Back like to the it. example of IT, for example, they are mm. very clear about what they want um, okay. and they get what they want, mm. mainly. Mm. So why? So we're going to have to do the same thing rather than sort of letting everything else happen to us, which yeah. is often the case, and without even saying, well, hold on, this won't work, but this will. We've got to we've got to be clear about what we want to achieve and go and and go and get it achieved. Hmm. Sorry, that might have sounded a bit um you no, know it's good. Rah, it's good. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> but I mean you know if we don't do it ourselves, who's who's going to do it for us? 
Uh. Um, and I think there is such a lot of confusion even within our own organisations about what pro- how what procurement can do. And we've got to start providing value add um, and providing value to the organisation and being clear about what it is that we can do. Yes, it's interesting. And uh, maybe that in, was, in that term... That was my hat, by the way, in terms of thinking like a buyer. Ah, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what what you just said was about also bringing more value to to the company and yes. uh, uh, just uh, maybe one or two weeks ago I was um, in a Contract Matters uh, web page you have the yes. fantastic page with articles and I was going yes. through your articles I have seen oh, them. I don't remember exactly how it was formulated but it was about uh, uh, like creating the value for for the company and you were elaborating about the Mm, cost and relationship yes. uh, part of, of that. I don't, yes. um, as I say, I don't remember exactly how it was. But can you elaborate about that as well? Like what is expected by the management yes. uh, of of the company from procurement department, and what can procurement department really deliver uh, is probably yes. much more than that. And yes. you touched it a bit just now. Yes. Can you elaborate? Sure. Well, I mean, yes, you can focus totally on cost. And, you know, of course, an organization will always want the costs to come down. But you've also got to... You've also got to focus on the relationship, relationship internally and relationship externally, and you can and and you know that is that can achieve a lot more than just focusing totally just on cost. Okay. So it's a internal and external relationship. This is what you mean. Okay. So it's also yes. what we said about internal buyers. Yes. Uh, or internal customers and then external customers, of course. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, Margaret, so interesting, but uh, we need to move on. I have a uh, few, few more questions uh, written in front of me. However, of course, they are not written in stone. We can change them. But uh, <laughs> okay. c- can you elaborate a bit more ab- about your, um, what I said, motivation and energies that you have in, in uh, procurement and in this uh, buyer-seller relationship? Oh. Um, what what motivates you to, to be in this... Uh, field for uh, quite some years now you said 26 27 years of yes. experience uh, how can how, how do you find this energy and motivation for yourself staying in this role developing this role further right well i've always um enjoyed procurement and i love it and i always want to make it better and and um you know and i and having the in the business that I that I'm in at the moment, it's really being able to make a procurement better for my clients and to be able to sort of sort of educate as I go and for them to understand and for them to make changes and differences and for them to see how it can be more effective for their own organisation. Um, I I like to I work for both sides, buyer and supplier, and not at the same time, obviously, because that's conflict of interest. <laughs> Um, but I want to make both sides better, not just the buyer side, but also the supplier side. It's what motivates me to get up in the morning and to travel a lot of a lot of um, a lot of distance, mm. and why I speak at international procurement conferences, why I write the books, why I write the articles. Because I mean, I don't claim to have all the answers. Don't get me wrong, but um, I've got a pretty good understanding of how most countries undertake their procurement, and you know, um, um, I just enjoy making a difference. And I think that we can't just leave procurement, you know, staying as it was 30 years ago. We've got to move with the times. Mm. And that's even more important now or going into the future when looking at where technology can take us and how that can affect procurement mm. practitioners' roles. So the motivation is there to, you know, I guess uh, I don't want to sound too um too big here but my unofficial vision for the business for 14 years has been to save the contractual world and if I and I'm sitting in New Zealand um, and if I want to save the contractual world I have to get out there to do it because the world won't come to New Zealand so the New Zealand is going to have to go to the world mm-hmm. and like it's it. also interesting you asked the question before about the differences in different countries but I think there's a difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere too 
Um, and, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think the Southern Hemisphere thinks around its problem of procurement issues and and, uh, and and manages those better and is more, and is, has the ability to be more flexible and looking at how the, what possible solutions there can be whereas the northern hemisphere especially in terms of Europe is very rules bound okay now I know all countries operate by procurement rules don't get me wrong but I think Europe seems to have got themselves tied up into all sorts of knots in terms of rules uh. And honestly, when I listen to you, it's this is my, my, yeah, exactly. But my personal feedback, being northern uh, hemispherean, if I if I say like this, but yes. when I listen to you, I I hear so much of uh, mm, relationship involvement, even in 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 in, uh, in the way you express yourself. And I mean, you talk a lot about what you you heard it yourself. I said soft factors, soft skills, and yes. Uh, to, to to my opinion, this is this is what uh, uh, distinguishes your approach and maybe the the approach of many other people. I was talking oh, also okay. to to Australian uh, specialists. Okay. Uh, also in the podcast, well, we were having few yes. people North uh, New Zealand and uh, uh, Australia, and I think this is what distinguishes you as well. It's it's yes. about being more concentrating more on relationship. Well, don't get me don't get me wrong because obviously if it comes to the contract or it comes to the relationship, the contract is a contract is the defining document. Um, but I I believe that relationships are important and you can achieve a lot more if you've got a good positive relationship going, mm-hmm. and you could sort of if you work together to make it happen, and that will lead, as I said earlier, about collaboration and being able to do, you know, something that's good for both sides. You know, it has to be a win-win. Getting, you know, using a negotiation term, win-win for both sides, doesn't it? I mean, that's where what I've always believed. Mm. Fantastic. And uh, so, otherwise, it just stays transactional. And I'm, and I'm, uh, well, yes, you can keep it transactional, but I would rather move it in terms <laughs> of how to do it better and work better together and make it transformational. Let's move into this topic. You were. Uh, co- if if you compare uh, the uh, procurement or whatever we called it 26 years ago yeah. then then go in with the time machine to today and then go yes. in 26 years from now can you elaborate yes. what what has happened now to last 26 sure. years and what do you think should happen the next 26 Alrighty. years what should we be ready for Alrighty. Um, well, in the last 26 years, it's kind of moved, and thank goodness for that, from being a clerical kind of role, which it always was, mm-hmm. to now sort of ha- uh, now sort of getting to the point of being uh, some people, some procurement people, getting to be able to be CPOs, chief procurement officers, and to get a room at the t- board table, um, and but and that's and that's positive and that's good. Um, uh, I think now that um, there is more focus on strategy, which badly needs to happen, I think. Um, and and of course, technology is a factor which has made yeah. change in the last period of time as well. And in terms of looking forward to the next 26 years, um, well, um, technology is going to be a, um, a factor more and more. And I think we've got to be ready for that. I don't think we are ready for that. I think that we can use technology to take some of the grunt work away from the basic procurement stuff to allow us to focus on procurement strategy and relationships. Um, if we don't, if we're not ready, we're going to become very irrelevant to the organisation because if technology can come in to the extent that apparently it can, and well, we've got to look at we've got to look at our what our role is going to be. It can't stay the same. Mm-hmm. We have to change with it. We have to pay attention to the technology coming along. And there's some thought that um, that seems seems to think that um, procurement in 15, 20 years there won't be a pers- people involvement, and I think that's a big mistake because technology cannot do the thinking, cannot do the relationship, and but we've got to be clear about what our role is going to be and fight for that, mm-hmm. and keep an open mind and then watching brief as to what the new technology coming along is. Yeah, because uh, and technology moment, cannot do relationship said, yet, you know, Margaret. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> I don't know where it's heading. Right. 
Well, I think we've also got to be careful because, you know, the supply, um, um, I've just been attending a couple of conferences recently and speaking mm. at a couple of uh, conferences recently in, in terms of technology and what's coming along and stuff like that. And, um, you know, uh, it's a little scary um, to hear what's sort of been talked about. And it's all been talked about by the supplier. So are we? Uh, so it seems to me procurement has got to get out of its own way and start providing some direction and saying what we need and want rather than just sort of going following others, which we've always done. Mm. You know, are telling us what how procurement should be done, and now suppliers are telling us what how procurement should be done. Whereas I think it's time that we sort of got a debate going amongst procurement practitioners and sort of saying, well, what do we want? And being clear about that, it's time for a de- more than one debate, in my humble opinion. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, good. 20 years I talk about robots sort of doing the lot and, you know, we won't need a human being. Well, you know, um, do we, yes, do we want that? I mean, really? And even <laughs> if you take the robots but take, take out of the equation, if you just take where um, technology can, apparently is going, um, well, you know, as I said before, if it can take away some of the grunt work, well, that's great. I'm happy for that. But mm. don't assume that technology can do everything around procurement because it can't. Yeah. So your opinion that we will not be substituted by some uh, computer or Excel sheet or something? Well, well, who knows? But the thing is this, if we don't change and we don't grow and we don't think about things from a strategic perspective and just get away from the grunt stuff mm. and, and, and whatever, then, as I said, we'll become irrelevant. So we've got to be relevant and so therefore moving in terms of the area of procurement strategy and looking at, uh, looking at that, that could be the focus of what a procurement practitioner's role should be in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Very interesting. But I, and I have to say that procurement practitioners are nowhere near where they need to be. Because, mm. you know, if they always say we've always done it this way, so why should we sort of look at other options and possibilities? You know, um, we'll never get there. Yeah. So ah, I, think, fantastic. I think we've got to be ready to move and be ready to be a bit more agile than we already are. Yeah. And, and be curious and be uh, like push yeah. yourself out of That's, this yes oh. interesting mm. fantastic but, what a vision <laughs> you said well, in my humble opinion in that which of course yeah is, uh, well i just think that we need a vision and we need a vision and we need a direction we just can't doing the same thing over and over and over again because some of what we're doing over and over and over again doesn't work the outcomes aren't achieve what we want so why do we continue to do the same thing over and over and over oh. again um so we've got to sort of think about how we do procurement better how to mm. do it smarter good uh, good tip and good advice and uh, well, st- still visionary but uh, very practical so the well I'm, I'm always come from a practical perspective exactly. and the books that I write are on a practical perspective because theory isn't going to get you there when the when the an issue arises mm. so um, dear listener advice from Margaret Gilbert today about uh, future of procurement uh, make yourself a vision and have some uh way forward you said about building the strategy that we desperately need in most of the organizations and also keep yep. keep, keep keep your uh, way forward and uh, know the direction where you are going otherwise yeah. you can be uh surprised think... in some years being in denial for too long yeah exactly mm. yep Fantastic, Margaret. We are uh, now coming closer to the end, but still I want to uh, touch upon the uh, books you were writing, Contract Matters. We we discussed it before. It's a series of books, Contract Matters. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, please tell us what are these books about and how did you come up with the need to really write the book here? Oh, okay. Well, I've got a story. I've got a story for you then, um, because it wasn't my idea to write a book. Um, okay. It was my brother's idea, who wrote me an email while I was in the United when I was working in the United States, saying you should write a book. And I'm going, yeah, right, you know. But I happened to be at an airport waiting to fly back to Washington D.C. because I'd been on holiday, and I mm. thought I took out a piece of paper and thought, well, what would be the logical to- uh, chapter headings? 
So okay. I wrote down what would be the logical chapter headings, and then the delay went on in terms of my flight getting back to Washington, D.C. So I thought, well, I might as well start. And um, by the time I got back to Washington, D.C., six hours later than I was supposed to, I had 80% of the first book written. <laughs> and it was only supposed to be one book. Okay. And, well, it's now 34 or five books later, which is what allows me to work in those countries that I mentioned before. Hmm. And some topics like negotiation and and thinking about the buyer-supplier relationship and how to change that. I mean, they are books that will go, can cross countries, if you know what I mean, cross boundaries, yes. because it's yeah, relevant. That's, that, that, that's what we discussed in the very beginning yes. uh, of this episode, that uh, the, the cultures can be different, but still the, the ways of working yes. should be very, very similar. Yes. So the books get used as course material and um, for the training and stuff like that and uh, for the consultancy. And so um, hmm, I find it, I find it, I, I use my travel time as to where I write the books because flying from New Zealand to anywhere takes a long time. <laughs> so I just make, I just make use of the plane trip time and the airport time and just always have a writing pad with me and <clears throat> do it that way. Fantastic. Yeah, really, really fantastic. And uh, as I said before, I will leave the link to to these um, uh, to those books, <coughs> not to this book, but to those books, uh, series of book contracts, contract sure. matters. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that our listeners can uh, see it, evaluate, and uh, uh, maybe even purchase. Hopefully, purchase. Yes. Indeed. And then uh, thank you for good. doing. <laughs> now I say it, it's my uh, pleasure to spread the best uh, practices uh, uh, best uh, minds of procurement also the, the thought leaders uh, in in this podcast so it's my pleasure Margaret yeah. and in the end of the uh, this episode if you can please uh, share some what I call big ideas what do you oh, want right. our listeners to, to, to have as a main takeaway maybe <clears throat> from this episode from listening to you what would it be if you would say one, two or three messages? Uh, what could it be? I think we've got to think bigger and broader. I think we need to get the procurement thinkers together in one room to talk about the issues that, are, that the world ha has in, around procurement. I think we need to be talking to the people who make the rules and regs and sort of say, well, you know, I think there needs to be a difference. I think we've got to recognise that there's a difference between the developing countries and developed countries. I mentioned about infrastructure issues before, especially around power. Um, there's not, I don't think, I think we've got to get away from this one size fits all scenario because it doesn't work, especially in developing countries. Um, I think we've got to get a better understanding going between the buyer and the supplier. I think we've got to work together. There's, okay, there's half dozen at least. Um, sorry, you wanted three, but I think I've just given you about six. <laughs> um, there's a lot of work to be done, I reckon, and I think that it's. Um, I think there's also uh, room for um, d a debate, debates plural, as to what, how we want to see procurement going forward, rather than rely letting it for others to decide for us and then us to complain later, uh, saying we don't like this. And I think that's what's happened up to this point, to be honest with you, in the last 26 years, mm -hmm. is that we've just allowed things to happen to procurement rather than being a part of. I think it's time that we spoke up, that we had a procurement voice, that we want us for change, that we stated what we want. Fantastic. I think that on these big ideas, we should finish the podcast. Thank you so much for, uh, for your you. time and for the time difference of uh, how, how many hours do we have? Uh, it's 11 uh, hours. Mm -hmm. 11 hours difference. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So being... And this you mentioned about technologies. So this is one of the beauty of technologies. It, I'm sitting here in Europe and you are sitting in uh, the in other New part Zealand. of the world in New Zealand. Yes. And yeah. uh, we have this fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. This time has uh, passed so fast that I couldn't. It is. Uh, so it was very, very interesting. And I hope our listeners also enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. It was so great talking to Margaret Gilbert today not only because of her great and rich experience in procurement, but also from her really visionary ideas and a great perspective on procurement processes and relationship between suppliers and buyers. 
because Margaret has really worked on both sides. I really have lost the sense of time, that's why this episode is a little bit longer than normally, but I'm sure that we will talk to Margaret again in the future, maybe on some more practical questions. We were discussing this with Margaret after our interview. But for now, leave your ratings and reviews below this podcast, share it to your friends, and of course you can ask us questions. We are in Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can find me there, Robert Freeman, or you can send us email, info at futureprocurement.net. This was Robert Freeman and Future Procurement. Talk to you soon. And as a little postscriptum for this episode, here is a excerpt from our pre-talk to Margaret. You are also in a way in love with procurement. So if you can spread a reason why you are in love with procurement or why you are doing these things you are doing. From my perspective, it's quite simple. I just want to make procurement better. <laughs> exactly.